Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 10, hear the word of the Lord. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. What's it mean to be God's people? Nations teach you what it means to be of their nation. This last week, Americans celebrated Thanksgiving because part of what it means to be an American, although we may not understand why, but part of what it means to be an American is to celebrate Thanksgiving. When I lived in Singapore and no one else around me was celebrating Thanksgiving, I still felt like I had to. I'm an American. I'm going to celebrate it. So I went to Denny's and ordered a turkey sandwich. That's the best I could do. Singaporeans learn what it means to be Singaporean. Indonesians learn what it means to be Indonesian. And Chinese learn what it means to be Chinese. And what's it mean, though, to be one of God's people? In 1779, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, Mrs. Dean, a widow, was proposed to by Captain John Fisk, and she accepted the proposal. There was just one problem. Mrs. Dean was a church member, a Christian, but Captain Fisk exhibited no, what they said, signs of grace. He was not a church member, although he may have attended church, and so he was not considered by the church to be a Christian. So Mrs. Dean's pastor, Stephen West, objected to the proposed marriage. Now, it wasn't that the pastor just refused to perform the ceremony. It, weddings were not performed by pastors in Puritan New England. They were performed by, by judges or by magistrates. What it meant to be a Christian for the Puritans was not where the wedding was performed or by who, but how you lived, including your whole married life, especially, of course, who you married. What it meant to be one of God's people is that God's people were not supposed to marry non-God's people. But Mrs. Dean was undeterred and so married Captain Fisk anyway, and she was promptly excommunicated. By 1779, though, things were different, even in New England. The American Revolution was in full gear and the times they were a change in. Rather than repent, the new Mrs. Fisk appealed to an ecclesiastical council, a committee of other pastors called from the area, to decide her case, possibly to override her pastor and her church. Mrs. Fisk believed that the realm of marriage was independent of the church. Her argument was that, quote, marriage is a transaction of a, uh, was purely a transaction of a civil kind. Separation of church and marriage, I guess. It was therefore outside the interest of the church. Being one of God's people, she thought, had no bearing on your marriage, on who you married. Well, she lost the case in 1779. Mrs. Fisk's attitude, though, that she could be a faithful Christian on Sunday morning, all right with God in this one area of her life, her life kind of broken down into separate walled off compartments with her faith here and her marriage over there, each disconnected that you could be one of God's people in your heart and that not affect your marriage. I guess maybe not your money or your work or your politics or your words, what you watch, you go on and on. That is just a, it's just a personal relationship. It may not affect anything else. 
that attitude that she had of, of Mrs. Fisk showed that Mrs. Fisk was a woman far ahead of her time. She was, in, in a way, a, a pioneer a modern American culture. And at the same time, that she was not all that different from the Israelites who lived about 2,000 years before her in Malachi's time. What's it mean to be one of God's people? Well, we see that here in the, in the third disputation of Malachi, this third dispute between the Lord and his people. To be one of God's people is to avoid two things. First, the trap of compromised covenants, and second, the tragedy of canceled covenants. What, what's it mean to be one of God's people? Well, first in verses 10 to 12, we see that God's people are in covenant. Hence, the name of the church. That's what we're named after. We are in covenant, of course, first with God. That's what most people think about. Uh, that is, that he has committed himself to us. Jesus sacrificed himself for us, and so he has made a new covenant. We celebrate that in the Lord's Supper. And so we respond, as we saw last week, in the acceptable act of worship, of giving our lives as a living sacrifice. Now, even here in Malachi's time, before the new covenant, God has covenanted himself with his people to be their God, and he expects them to respond by being his people. But what's it mean to be the people of God? It means that they are in covenant. Not only with God. Notice how he starts here. S surprising to us. Notice verse 10. Have we not all one father? Who's the we? It's not all humanity. That's the way many modern people may read this. All humanity has God as their father. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. H have we, we not all one father? Has not God created us? And he means this nation. We are faithless. And, ver and he goes on, verse 10. This is the we, Judah, Israel. And if we could say for ourselves, since the church, Israel is the church, then he's talking about us. Uh, no, verse 10. Why then have we been faithless to each other? To each other. Do you notice that? The covenant he's talking about first is to each other. God accuses them of being faithless, of breaking his covenant with each other. They returned from Babylon, they rebuilt the temple, they reinstituted worship, they have priests, they have sacrifices. Remember, they have reformed. They've had, they put a lot of attention to their religion. They can even get very emotional about their religion. In verse 13, notice they cover the altar with tears, he says. Now they're going to the temple, they're, they're crying, they're weeping, they groan during their worship. So this wasn't just some dead religion we're talking about. They were just going through the motions with their mind off somewhere else. Now, they were exuberant. They were passionate. They were even heartfelt. It was just restricted to one part of their heart. They would go to the temple and weep and moan and let themselves out. In the good times, they might, who knows, they might be jumping around, dancing like David danced, getting happy in the Lord, some would say. And then they would go out and date and marry. We call it date, that's a modern thing, but you know what I mean, whatever their equivalent was, and married just like anyone else. Maybe handle their money just like anyone else, or vote like anyone else, or talk like anyone else. Being one of God's people, they thought, had no impact on those other areas of life. Now, they're shocked to hear that the Lord won't accept their sacrifice in verse 14. Why does he not? Why does he not accept our sacrifice? We're doing it with such emotion, with such passion. They're trying to get that religious part of their life just right. Why should God care about this other part? You know, the marriage compartment. For, for us today, maybe it's the money compartment or the politics compartment or the talking compartment, the eating and drinking. If we're emotional about God, does he really care about all that stuff? Does he care about our love life? Does he care about our money? Oh, yes, he does. He cares a lot. Here in verses 10 and 11, we see that he equates marrying unbelievers to be a breaking of our covenant. And first, oddly enough, it's breaking of our covenant with each other. Which modern Christians are hardly aware that they're supposed to have a covenant with each other. But here they have, right? You've broken covenant with each other. It is faithlessness. It's a betrayal of God's community of the church. Notice those strong words. It is faithlessness. It's an abomination. It's profaning. Well, what is an abomination? What is so profane? 
We would normally think some, some heinous sin, something disgusting and something perverted. Are they sacrificing their children in a fire to Baal? Now we see at the end of verse 11, it's all because that many have, quote, marry the daughter of a foreign God. They're marrying people who don't believe in the Lord. That's what's an abomination. That's what's faithless. That's what's profaning. This was the compromised covenant. By marrying those who don't believe in the Lord, they have, they have formed a covenant. That's what a marriage is, a covenant, a binding agreement. It's not based on mutual interest like a contract, but a mutual obligation. They have formed such a binding agreement based on a mutual obligation with people who are not bound to the Lord. And now there's no hint yet that that's led to idolatry. It's not as though you marry these people and they're leading you to be worshipers of Baal or whoever. That's the reason it's wrong. No, he's, he's not suggesting that yet. Let's be clear. God considers the intentional entering into a committed relationship, a marriage with a non-believer, to be a lack of, of loyalty, a lack of love, first to each other, to the church. And we think, like Mrs. Fisk, what does the church have to do with our marriage? It's a transaction purely of a civil kind. God says, who you marry impacts the church because you bring them with you. Even if they're unbelievers and they never physically come with you. Notice how he describes this sin, first starting in verse 10. First, he reminds us that we, as God's people, have one father. That's the we there. Is he not our one father? He's our father of believers, one creator. The fact that we have one father means that we are related then to each other, bound to each other in a way that is not true of those who are outside, those who are not believers. They don't have God for their father. Okay, just be clear. But just as you are related and close to someone who has the same parents as you do, you have a, a bond with them that makes them closer normally uh, to, to you than someone who hasn't shared those parents. We have the same father, the same creator. So to call yourself one of God's people and then live just like the world, even to the point of first seriously dating and marrying someone, like you're connected to them in the same way you're connected to each other, but dating, marrying someone who you know not to be one of God's people, that, God says, is faithless. It is disloyal to that community, to the church, is to commit treason. Now, the second way God describes this kind of relationships is that they are faithless to him. It is our breaking faith with God. That is, the one who makes a marriage covenant with a non-believer is unfaithful to the Lord. To be unfaithful to, is to be faithless. It's, that is, to have no faith. Not enough faith to believe that being loyal to the Lord is sufficient, even if it means passing up some relationship. That he is enough. That he will supply you with a relationship that he doesn't regard as an abomination. That isn't compromised or compromising. Or that he will be enough for you. So you don't need a compromised relationship. We are faithless to him because by entering into such relationships, we show that our relationship with Jesus is such a low priority in our lives. It's just such, it's such, such a minor consideration of our lives that we can be submitted to someone who doesn't share it. It's, just, it's not a deal breaker. That's the way you, a believer thinks, commits, marries someone who's not a Christian. It's as if we're saying, okay, we're evaluating this person. Okay, she likes Chinese food. I like Chinese food. She likes golf. I like golf. She hates Jesus. I love Jesus. Well, two out of three is not bad. It's like we put them on that level. If we can be so close to someone who has no faith, then we show them that we've broken faith. Such relationships are entered into without faith. And Paul says in Romans that everything done without faith is sin. Because it is faithless, the third way the Lord describes this compromise covenant, that is choosing to covenant with someone who won't covenant to the Lord, is as an abomination. It's one of those Old Testament words, and that means it is, it's detestable. Something's an abomination is, is something that is it's disgusting. It's repugnant. It's something that you want out of your sight right away. You don't want to see it. You don't want to consider it. Something that makes you cringe. You hate to see. And God says in the second half of verse 11, it is a profaning of the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves. He loves the sanctuary. That's where he's worshiped. 
He loves it, and yet they are profaning it. They're making it profane, making it common. Profaning means making something common that is special, that is set aside for the Lord. Now, to profane the sanctuary is to treat it like any other place. It is the place or the people uh, which he loves. In the new covenant, his sanctuary is the church. It's a people, not, not a building. He has set aside his people for worship. And he loves the church, not the building, but the people of God on earth. And, and it means something special to him to be one of God's people and expects his people to be worshiping. And yet these people bring something that's disgusting, something filthy and stinking into it. They bring themselves after they've entered into compromised and compromising covenants. They make it like any other place or people. Now, some of you may think right now that well, this is much more complicated. You know, you're, just, you're making it sound so cut and dry. There's much more complicated issue. There are exceptions, after all. There's, there's times when a believing spouse leads an unbeliever to believe. And it's true there are exceptions. But there are exceptions that prove the rule. First, let's be clear about what we're, we're not talking about. We're not talking about a marriage in which one spouse has been converted after they were married. And then the other one still not converted. Right? The Apostle Paul specifically addresses that in, in 1 Corinthians 7. And there's no fault in a situation like that. Nothing wrong, nothing to criticize about that. The believer is supposed to stay faithfully married even if the other spouse remains unconverted. There, Paul says, you know, who knows? He doesn't give a guarantee, but he says, who knows? God may use the witness of the believing spouse to save the other. We also are not talking about situations in which one partner uh, appeared, maybe professed to be a Christian, especially in a culture like this, where so many people profess to be Christians, many are not, what, which one partner professes to be a Christian before the marriage, and then after the marriage, maybe after a time, eventually shows that he or she was probably never really converted in the first place. That, that too, I don't think there's any fault or, or sin or anything to criticize about the believer who finds himself in that situation. Uh, maybe he, maybe the, the one who appeared to be a Christian before marriage and now is not, obviously not one, maybe he was just going to church for the girls. That happens. Or maybe she was just never really owned the faith that her parents raised her in. She, just, she thought was a Christian because he was told she was as a, as a, as a girl and now she's, when she's raised, she's not really a believer. Now in that case, there was no intentional covenant with someone known not to be in a covenant with the Lord. So we are not then free to think, well, then the, the marriage is an abomination and I should divorce. No, then you also stay and try to win your spouse who you now know is not a believer. Try to win them to the Lord. Now, some protests, oh, he's still too cut and dry, still too simplistic. I know relationships in which the non-believer seems to be so right for the believer. They're so happy together. How could that possibly be, like God calls it here, faithless, abominable, profane, but look at the long term. Sure, at first they may appear to be good for each other, but follow the relationship for long enough. Often the relationship is slowly eroding the believer's commitment to the Lord. After a while, the believer gets more and more detached from the church, the covenant community, and he or she becomes more and more like not God's people, like the unbelieving spouse. Some eventually fall away, especially if they become involved with members of heretical groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. Many eventually become converted to those groups and they are lost. And not only are they lost, but their children end up, as in verse 12, cut off from the people of God. And so lost too. The wife of the, the well-known author, uh, Mark Twain, was supposedly a Christian when she married him, but he was not. He was a skeptic and, and she knew it, but she married him anyway, thinking, she could convert him. Now, at first, he played along with his wife's religion, even leading the family Bible reading and prayer times, you know, but really just to make her happy. And then he eventually dropped out of that, admitting that he just didn't believe it. Eventually, his lack of faith was contagious, and she too became a non-believer. It's some time of grieving and loss. Uh, Mark Twain encouraged his wife to seek comfort in her faith, to which she responded, I can't because I don't have any. Now, I'm sure that relationship started out with someone saying, oh, OK, he's not a believer, but aren't they just so good for each other? 
And in the early stages, probably people said, look, she's leading him to the Lord. Now, I know relationships are complicated, and there are all kinds of complicated situations. I know of people who thought they were Christians until they became involved in a non-Christian, and then they had to face the reality of, of why, why have I got into this relationship with a non-Christian? They had to examine themselves. Why am I no different than not God's people? That I'm attracted to not God's people. Dating and marriage is a test, an examination, a test of your faith. If you are full of faith, that fullness of faith will make you faithful in who you marry or who you stay married to. Some people are tested and they see that they failed the test. They see they lack some faith. And they, then they know they need to be filled with real faith. So God uses the test, sometimes relationships, to bring, them, to bring people to himself. Now, yes, Christians can unintentionally get involved with someone who is not a believer, but to do it intentionally, that is, like, to eyes, with eyes wide open, walk into a relationship with someone who, who you know is not one of God's people, is an act of faithlessness. It's breaking our covenant commitment with his people and with him. And God sees that as abominable and profane. So single people and youth should determine now not to play with fire. Don't start a relationship with someone you know to be a non-believer. I think it's the logical implication of this passage. Pastor John Piper said that as a young man, he made a simple commitment to the Lord. Quote, I will never fall in love with a person who does not love Jesus. He said, if I say I love God with all my heart and soul and, and mind, he is my treasure and my all in all and yet then cultivate a romantic relationship with a woman I know that does not care for God, and does not obey Him, then I'm being profane, like not God's people. I'm betraying the God I claim to love. From a female point of view, Nancy Lee DeMoss, in a book called Lies Young Women Believe, challenges her readers to take what she calls the, the Truth Seekers Relationship Pledge, which says, quote, I purpose never to become involved in a relationship with a guy who is not a true believer of Jesus Christ and whose character and lifestyle are not consistent with the kind of man I believe God wants me to marry someday. What's it mean to be one of God's people? It means to be like God, a covenant keeper. To be a covenant keeper, guard yourself against the tragedy of canceled covenants. Now, like the nations around them, the Israelites were divorcing. So not only are they marrying people who didn't believe in the Lord, they're also divorcing each other just like everyone else. Now, here they come to their altar, covering it with tears. They're passionate. They're seemingly seeking an answer from God. Why is he not hearing our prayers? After all, they're thinking he's the covenant-keeping God. You know, they're saying he, he told us in Deuteronomy that if we make these sacrifices, if we do the religion right, then he will bless us with life. He made a promise. He made a covenant. Where is he? Now, they're surprised that God isn't, isn't keeping what they think is his end of the covenant. But then they're going out and, and breaking their own covenants. They break their marriage covenant. And so God sees that. The Lord is a witness. He says in verse 14, notice that, verse 14. He's a witness to their and to our marriage commitments. Notice verse 14. The, the, Lord's, an, the Lord's not answering their prayers because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth. He was there. The wife of your youth, that's, that's the woman you married when you were young. That's why in the traditional wedding ceremony we say, we are gathered here together together in the sight of God. And this passage shows us that God takes our marriage commitments very seriously. A lot of times today, people take those, oh, those vows like they're, like they're ornaments. They're just meaningless kind of words that just sound nice and poetic. But God's there and he's saying, I expect you to keep all that. He's there at weddings, witnessing the vows and holding us to them, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. Lovely, 
artful words. And God expects us to keep them. Now, in marriage, he makes one of one, us one with our spouse. He says in verse 15, did he not make them one? He calls it a union. He says his spirit was involved in that union. And he is seeking not only our happiness, though he does want to bless us and make us happy, but also he says in the middle of verse 15, he is seeking godly offspring. That is children who have seen an example of covenant love and loyalty in the love and loyalty a married couple show to each other, keeping, not canceling, their marriage covenant. Now, in that covenant, a couple is to raise godly offspring. That is, teach their children how to be God's people. Teach them the gospel. Teach them their need for salvation. Bring them to church. The man who divorces, just out of so-called irreconcilable differences, no-fault divorce, going on in my way here in our culture in the past like 10, 20 years, talked a lot about you know, gay marriage, so we're just offended by that. Marriage in this country was really undone by the, what, what legally was called no-fault divorce, as though there could be such a thing. Once you did that, then everything else just kind of follows. So the, the man, the person who divorces out of so-called irreconcilable differences because he's lost that loving feeling, the song goes that way, right? Or because someone younger has caught his eye, having a midlife crisis and wants to imagine that he's young again, he's in his 20s, so goes after a girl who's in her 20s to help him feel young again. He, he abandons the wife whom he married when he was really in his 20s, you know, the wife of his youth, who stayed with him when he wasn't well off, when he hadn't finished his education or hadn't, didn't yet own a home or have anything, maybe even followed him to some far off forsaken place like Danville, Virginia. Can you believe it? A man who divorces like that has, he says here, has first committed adultery and then done violence. Divorce is not a victimless crime. Unfaithfulness to a marriage commitment is an act of violence. He has cut in two, one flesh that God created. God made them one, he says. You've now cut it in two. It's violent. He split with the sword of his adultery, the union God made. He's acted like the covenant breakers of the world. Not like God, not like God's people. And so if he goes to the temple or to the church, he profanes it. Some translations like the NIV or even the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is, this would be what the, the apostles mostly use, translates verse 16 as saying, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. Now, sometimes now I understand I hate dealing with the issue of divorce because it's extremely complicated and there's all kinds of things going on. I understand now in our culture, both parties, in their day only a man could divorce his wife. A wife really couldn't do divorce back. In our culture, of course, both parties can apply for divorce and for no reason, no fault divorce, or in some situations where divorce is really just an actual already a fact. That is one spouse maybe has, has left and is living already living with someone else. It's a fact in actual practice where people have divorce just by the way they live. So and so legal divorce then becomes just unavoidable. But if we're faithful to our covenant with the Lord, we should do everything that we can on our end, in our power, to keep the covenant. Avoid the curse of canceled covenants. The solution, God says in verse 16, is to guard yourselves in your spirit. Guard yourself. Let's be diligent. Like a guard on duty at a wall. You're like a sentinel looking out, ex expecting to be attacked by some vicious enemy at any time. You're on the edge. What? You're guarding yourself. And here, guard what comes into your heart and could attack you or your marriage for ingratitude, for what you have, for bitterness, for unforgiveness, maybe for too high expectations, for temptations to be drawn to someone else or for communication with members of the opposite sex that's just too personal. Watch out for the way you relate to people of the opposite sex. Now, of course, online. And so that it, they don't become, in your heart, inappropriate. For example, I'll go off the top of my head, for example, I, on, online, like on Facebook, I, I try never to comment on a woman's appearance, even if they look great. 
because it just seems flirtatious. Just like a week or so ago, my own niece, okay, put up a picture of herself. She looks nice. And I made an exception to that. But I even showed Mary. I wrote it out. I showed it her. Is this acceptable? Okay. Even my own niece. I just, you got to guard yourself. Be on guard against anything that could make a relationship inappropriate, even heading in that direction. Be on guard against pornography, any of it. If you have a weakness for porn, then have someone else help guard you. Have covenant eyes. And then be on guard for, if you have that weakness, even the nudity in some R-rated movies. Be on the lookout for anything that can make you a covenant breaker. Guard yourself from the attitude that this relationship and this is our attitude today. This relationship is just there to make me happy. And if it's not doing that right now, then I'll just throw it away like a used styrofoam cup. Guard yourself against that attitude. Guard yourself to stay faithful, even when it's not fun anymore. Be diligent to watch your fantasies, even your yearnings to be young again, like a good guard. Keep the wrong thoughts out and the right ones in. Don't be faithless, unfaithful. Grow to become like God himself, the ultimate covenant keeper. What's it mean to be one of God's people? Well, it means that every part of your life is lived for the Lord. God is here angry at their compartmentalized religion. The religion says that I can love God in my heart. I could weep and wail at church or laugh and shout. But my love life, you know, that's separate. My money, that's another compartment. My politics or my job or my words, my commitments, my giving, my spending, my consumption. That's untouched by my faith. It has nothing to do with the Lord. Like Mrs. Fisk religion. It's a, it's a religion kept safely in its own little box. And outside the box, we think we can date and marry or divorce like anyone else or handle our money like anyone else or eat and drink like anyone else or, or vote like anyone else. But God sees that and says, faithless, that kind of compartmentalized, disintegrated religion creates self-indulgent covenant breakers. And it's the opposite of who the Lord is. He is the one God. He is integrated the one, the same Father, one Creator who demands to be the Lord of all our lives, even over our dating and sex and marrying, over our money, our giving and our spending, our words, over what we watch on TV or the internet, over what we eat or we drink or we say, over our time, our work, our politics. To be one of God's people means everything about all your life. So, the first need of those with a compartmentalized religion, like Mrs. Fisk, like a covenant breaker who claims to love the Lord in the box of his heart, but then lives like anyone else in the rest of his life, the first need, even if they have an emotional faith, but they've kept that separate from how they live, their first need is not to be told to stop doing that, Start doing this. Stop dating her. Stop texting him. Don't look at that website. No, their first need is to see whether they are really in the faith at all. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Don't you know Christ is in you unless you fail the test. If he is in you, he will not be confined to your religion, to Sunday morning. He won't be put in a box. He will be the Lord of all your life. He's made a covenant with you and he will certainly keep it. He will be faithful. And if you're in the faith, so will you. Full of faith in every part of your life. But if your faith can be so easily confined, boxed in, if it doesn't fill your dating or courting, whatever you want to call it, or your married life, your, your, your money, your work, your family, all your life, then you ought to examine yourself, ask yourself whether you fail the test, whether you have been 
faithless. 